Hi guys, and welcome back to Cosmetic Surgery and Coffee, the vlog. This is episode three, and we'll be talking about Tummy Tuck 101. <laughs> so, as you know, uh, this is my vlog, and I want to make sure that with it, we're educating the public about plastic surgery topics and general health topics. And, you know, when I start one of these episodes, I always start with the Did You Know section. So today's Did You Know is going to be about six health hacks for men. And this is from an article from Men's Health Magazine, and I'll put the link down below in the uh, description box, and you can go read about all the details. So let's go over these six health hacks, or six, yeah, I guess there's six health hacks for men in particular, but I'm assuming you this could, some of this could be generalized for women. So the first hack... Um, is if you can't take at least 10,000 steps every day, research out of Norway has shown that uh, men who do three 10-minute brisk walking sessions per day have reduced their overall death rate from all causes by up to 40%. So a little bit of activity every day is good for you. Now, in one of our previous uh, se sessions, we talk about, uh, actually, I'm sorry, in one of the future sessions, we'll probably talk about Alzheimer's and as you know, exercise is very good for Alzheimer's, so aging and exercise go hand in hand. Men should be doing a little bit of activity, uh, kind of in small bursts, three times a day. So 10 minutes, three times a day, and you can reduce your chance of dying from any cause by about, up to 40%. Now, of course, we're all going to die, but at least, you know, you can have a long life this way. So another hack is about uh, the application of sunscreen. So now I know a lot of men just for whatever reason, don't wear sunscreen. Now, I wear sunscreen every day. I use a 50 SPF, and I cover myself from my face to my ears, down to my neck and upper decollete. Why? Because I have to keep my face looking young. It's part of what I do for a living. If you're not, if you watch a plastic surgeon that looks old and haggard, are you going to trust them? <laughs> no. You got to look at a plastic surgeon that's aging well, and that gives you an idea that they know what they're doing when you come into their office. So, if you're not going to be a guy that puts on sunblock every day. A good piece of advice is to put on sunblock just to the areas that have the highest risk of skin cancer development. And one of the biggest skin cancers is something known as basal cell carcinoma. In fact, basal cell carcinoma is the number one cancer in the world. Now, it's a very benign cancer. The chances of dying from basal cell are so small as to be reproducible in the literature. So I wouldn't worry about getting it, but the big cancer that's very related to sun exposure is something called squamous cell carcinoma, and that's a much more devastating problem and that kind of cancer could kill you. So sunblock's going to help you, but the areas that you'd want to cover would be your nose, eyelids, and lips. Now those areas happen to be very, very exposed to the sun because they stick out off of the face and they get a little bit more intense sun exposure. So if you did eyelids, nose, and lips, you're covering yourself pretty well. And this obviously goes both for men and women, but um, Try to keep an SPF above 30 because an SPF above 30, especially in something known as a physical block, a physical block, not a chemical block, will decrease UV exposure by 97% minimum. So sunblocks beyond that for general use probably are not necessary, but when we do a laser or we do a microneedling or a chemical peel, we don't take any chances and we, act, we ask our patients to just use a 50 SPF or above. So. Here's our third hack from Men's Health Magazine, and it's about flossing. Now, if you forget to floss on a daily basis, and I am guilty of that, I hate flossing, but if I do, I, my teeth always feel better, my breath is better, and so, you know, flossing is good for you. Um, if you can't floss, it's good to keep those little dental sticks around, the ones that either have just the little tiny um, plastic tips on there so you can scrape your teeth out after meals, um, or the kinds that have the little twisties where you can twist them through the gaps between your teeth. Now, anybody who hasn't been living under a rock for the last 10 years knows that your dental health is actually key to the health for the rest of your body. And it's been shown in the dental literature and just in practical terms, especially in just general medicine, that poor dental health leads to a lot of other things, primarily poor cardiac health. And since your heart is sort of the center of all in your world. If your heart goes bad, you go bad. Taking care of your teeth is very, very important. Um, and of course, from, a, from an anti-aging standpoint, good strong teeth maintain good strong bone in the maxilla and the mandible, which means that as you're aging, while your skull is starting to shrink and you're starting to wonder why your eyebrows are sagging and your cheeks are sagging and the corners of the mouth are sagging, 
you're losing bone. So good strong teeth keep your bone as strong and as volumized as long as possible because we're all going to lose that bone in our face. We're all going to get old and look old. But again, slow things down with good dental health. Um, here's the next one that I thought was good. Uh, if you can't have sex at least three times a week, you're not alone, of course, they say. But um, here's what you're missing. You get a reduced risk of erectile dysfunction when you actually have sex every week. So uh, Dr. Darius Paduk, who's an MD, PhD, and a director of sexual health and medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College, he recommends three weekly orgasms. And he says, hit the gym also. Men who log at least two hours of strenuous exercise each week have harder erections than less active men. So, you know, keep your blood flow up in your body and all parts of your body. Uh, get good sleep. Um, keep, your keep your body fat low. Control your blood sugars. Control your cholesterol. All those things help you maintain good erections. And so that's for you guys out there that are having issues with it. Uh, our fifth hack, if you can't sit up straight at your desk, compensate by bending over backwards. Now what this does is slouching deconditions your back muscles because you're bent forward and you're starting to weaken and lengthen the, the, the muscles to the back and that changes your support for your core. It also depletes you and it puts you in a bad mood. You know, slouching is a sign of a bad mood. So don't slouch, stand up straight. That's the one thing my dad, who was an orthopedic surgeon and did spine surgery, would always tell me, he's like, stop slouching, mm -hmm. stand up straight. And he'd always give me these exercises where he's like, stick your arms up, rotate your shoulders, and that will help, um, you know, get you nice and straight and stand up straight. So if you can't walk it off, then stand up and place your hands on your hips. Now slowly bend backwards. Do this a few times every hour to undo the havoc from the bunching up. You want to make sure that when you're working out at the gym, you're working out your back muscles and you're working out your front anterior core muscles because you want a nice straight mid spine. You're going to have a little curve in the upper back, you're going to have a little curve in the cervical spine, and you're going to have a little sciatic curve as well. Those are all normal curves. The spine is not a straight pole. It's actually a cur S curved type um, entity. So you want to have some curve, but you need the muscle strong around the front and the back of the spine to maintain core strength and, you know, decrease the risk of injuries, decrease the risk of back strain, etc. Uh, and finally, if you can't rally yourself to cook your own meals, uh, stop inviting extra calories to dinner. So people who eat fast food three or more times a week are 81% more likely to be obese than those who eat it uh, less than once a week. Now, obviously the best thing you can do if you really want to be good is pre-make your meals, freeze them in the freezer and just take them out as you need. Now, it's not the most sexy thing in the world to do, especially for foodies like me where I'd love to <laughs> eat, um, but it's something you can do. So meal prep or meal prep services are a good little hack you, if you have been to McDonald's or Burger King recently, it's not cheap. And in the eight to 13 bucks you might spend for a regular or even a large size meal at one of these places, you've made most of a really good healthy meal at home. Uh, and if you do it in portions, you can get portion control. You can make some uh, variability in your diet, have it all pre-frozen and ready to go uh, that you can you know pack in your day's belongings when you get to the office. Uh, you can have it ready for pre-gym snack, post-gym snack, that sort of thing. So those are six basic health hacks that men can do. And, you know, we're all, we're all busy. You mm -hmm. know, having these health hacks and life hacks, I think, have kind of become the hot trend. But I think they're more than a trend. I think they're giving people an opportunity to um, spend more time on things that matter in their lives right. and not spend so much time on these little mundane details that when we do try to do them, they bore us so badly we actually don't even get anything done. So I think life hacks are intended to act, actually allow us a little bit more fullness and a little bit more completion in our life. Yep, those are good. Yeah. Definitely good. Cool. And pretty easy. I think so. I mean, who, 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 who has a hard time, you know, with a few of these things? We spend so much time, especially with social media guys, you know, we spend so much time wasted on a lot of things that don't provide us value in our lives. And I think that's the hard thing. It's easy to get distracted. We're so busy that we try to come home and turn our brains off. I mean, mm -hmm. small things shouldn't be turned off, though. I mean, they, they, I think, provide us better lives. They provide us better health. Just good longevity. I mean, if you're going to live, at least live properly. And well. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. All right. So do you want to tell everybody what we're talking about today? So we're talking about tummy tucks. Now, tummy tucks are a very common procedure, and there's lots of reasons people get tummy tucks, but the most common reason is... Women who have had babies usually get stretched out skin and loose muscle that basically makes their midsections 
flabby and misshapen and it makes it hard to fit clothing. And so for a lot of them, they're done having their kids and they want to have nice, flat, tight tummies. And a tummy tuck, plus and minus liposuction, is a very good way to create a permanent, flat abdomen um, in healthy patients. Now, with the absolute burgeoning population of surgical weight loss patients as well in the last decade, we're also seeing a lot of post-weight loss patients who need what we call post-bariatric contouring of the body, but that's more advanced, more extensive surgeries than just a tummy tuck alone, but a tummy tuck is certainly a component of that. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, how, how is someone to know if they're a candidate for a tummy tuck or not? I mean, I think, I think the best way to think about your, whether you're a candidate is if you can stand up straight and you can pinch, you know, a moderate amount of loose skin, there is a tummy tuck that could work for you. Now, some people want to try and use some of these non-invasive technologies like Thermi and J-Plasma and um, Body Tight. And these are mm -hmm. potential technologies for helping loose skin. But in the event that those fail or that you really have too much loose skin for them, you can at least have a mini tummy tuck, you know, and that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean you get your muscles repaired. You could have like you could be one of those women. I've seen this is Colorado, so our moms around here they they span a really wide gap of body types because this is such an athletic part of the country. We have plenty of these women in their sub thirties who they've had two kids and they have the tiniest bit of pooch and they have a little bit of loose skin below their abdominal wall. It's not an it's too much for these non invasive technologies but they can get a little low incision, lower than a C-section scar, and pull down that lower abdominal wall excess skin. They don't even have an incision around their belly button. And especially if they carried their babies low, usually they have that pooch in the muscle. Mm -hmm. We can actually just repair the lower half muscles, and they can do a mini tummy tuck in the office. So walk Sometimes, us through yeah. what is the difference between a mini and a full. Sure. So a mini tummy... So, so when I talk about tummy tucks, I talk about tummy tucks in categories such as this. You have either just loose lower abdominal skin, which is below the belly button, or you have loose skin above and below. If you're just loose below, that's a mini tummy tuck. Okay. If you're loose above and below, that's a full tummy tuck, and I'll explain the differences in a minute. The second part of the decision is some women have very tight muscles despite having had children because they were typically very athletic. I mean, talking about gym rats and so they very rarely have loose muscles because their core is so strong that a baby really you know the development of a child in the abdominal wall cavity does not destroy their abdomen like it destroys the abdomen of most women i mean that's a fact hmm. in that case if no matter how many sit-ups you do no matter how low your body fat is and you don't have a flat abdomen but you've had children then you're a candidate for muscle repairs and so the muscles, we call them the six packs. They're two lines of four blocks of muscle on each side, but they have a membrane in the middle, and that membrane thins out, and you get what's called a diastasis or split of the rectus muscles, which you guys call the six pack. It's called a diastasis recti. And so we repair that by suturing together with permanent sutures that space and gap, and bringing those two lines of four packs together to make a proper eight pack. And those permanent sutures pretty much make you, um, it's like kind of basically wearing an internal girdle made out of suture. We basically rebuild the stretched out abdominal wall muscles. Now, there's four layers to the abdominal wall musculature, so you're not repairing all four layers, but you're repairing the most visible split, which is the rectus muscle diastasis or split. Okay. So when you do a mini tummy tuck, you can actually do that in the office because it's just a little local anesthetic and a small incision in the lower abdominal wall and you lift up the excess skin, pull it down, trim off the excess, and boom, wow. you're tight. And it can be easily done. Uh, usually we put little drains in there so that mm -hmm. any fluid that forms can drain out over that first week, plus or minus repairing that lower muscle. Now, if somebody needs a full tummy tuck, which is really what most women get is the full tummy tuck, I put them under general anesthesia because I don't. I wouldn't want to be awake for something big like that. I mean, it's a big operation. Yeah. It's one of the largest operations in all of cosmetic surgery, if not the largest operation. It has the longest recovery. It probably has the most discomfort from it. Um, but, you know, it's permanent. Like, once you're done with it, that is your new abdominal wall unless you, you know, assault your body by eating 
hamburgers three times a week as we discussed in the life <laughs> hacks or health hacks. So, I mean, if you take good care of yourself after a tummy tuck, I mean, it's done. And I've done tummy tucks on women as early as their early 20s, and I've had women in their 70s. Obviously, the stronger your tissues are when you have a tummy tuck, the better the overall result and longevity are going to be. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that the scar is even below a C-section scar, so it's definitely hidden underneath the um, Under below a bikini line. Yeah, and it really depends on it depends on the tissue conditions around the 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 the, the um, mons or a vaginal area because if it's uh -huh. really loose down there, you know the scar can migrate up, and that's one of the miscalculations you can sometimes see in tummy tucks is the surgeon didn't calculate properly the laxity or the looseness of the mons vaginal area and mm -hmm. the scar migrates up to where it's almost looking like it could be not hidden by a belt. Mm -hmm. So you want to be able to re you want to pre-calculate the best you can all those tensions when you're marking out how low you want to make the scar. Ultimately the scar is designed for not string bikinis. I mean you're never going to hide it with a string bikini in most women. Mm -hmm. So a panel bikini or you know, boy shorts, that's what you hide it for. Because there's, and, and if you do the full time attack, you know, you have to make the little incision around the belly button because you have to, when you're lifting up the abdominal wall off the six pack muscles to repair the six pack muscles, you have to disconnect the belly button. Mm -hmm. In most cases, there is a technique called floating the umbilic, umbilicus where we actually don't detach it, but it's not everybody that can have that operation. So traditional tummy tucks will also have an incision and closures around the belly button. So obviously we want to make a really cute belly button out of it. And sometimes when we're doing the belly button repairs, we find umbilical hernias or belly button hernias. Mm -hmm. We have to fix those as well. So it's a good time for a surgeon to evaluate a woman's abdominal wall, look for things like hernias. Cause you know, a lot of these women are now in their forties and fifties getting it done. And by that time they've had laparoscopic surgery and somebody's penetrated through their abdominal wall with a scope to look for their endometriosis or to figure out why they're not getting pregnant or whatever. So a lot, you know, a woman's abdominal wall tends to have a lot of, you know, ingress to a lot of different procedures over the course of somebody's life, li lifetime. One thing that does need to be known is that, you know, if you're going to get a tummy tuck, the nature of the blood supply to your abdominal wall has got to be really pr thoroughly pre-evaluated by your surgeon. Because in the old days when people did lots of open gallbladder surgeries, they get that really long incision along the right rib cage. Mm -hmm. And so once you cut through that part, you've now cut part of the blood supply to the upper half of the right abdominal wall. You can't do a traditional tummy tuck in that situation. So what would you do? You actually get what's called a fleur-de-lis. The fleur-de-lis is the sign of the French flag, right? right? Um, it looks like an inverted T incision. So you get an incision from the base of your sternum straight down and around your belly button, straight down to your pubis, and then across as a T. Wow. Because you have to have blood supply intact, right, left, top, and bottom, mm -hmm. so that each individual quadrant can get enough blood supply and you don't end up with a wound healing problem. Because that's one of the devastating consequences of a poorly performed tummy tuck, is you could lose part of your abdominal wall, and it's months of recovery. So we don't want women to go through that. Well, not anybody to go through that, but we just, you know, you want to get, you're coming in, as a patient, you're coming in to have cosmetic surgery. You're looking at all these people in social media and in Hollywood, and you're just looking at their great after baby bodies, and that's all you care about. So our job as surgeons is to do our best to plan for a successful operation, you know, but we can't stop every patient from screwing things up. Right. You know, one of the biggest screw-ups is smoking. And that hurts all of the healing process. Absolutely. Absolutely. As we talked, and everything. Yeah, and we talked about that last time. You know, yeah. you know, nicotine, it's a blood vessel constricting agent. So when you've got a very large incision on the lower abdominal wall and you've lifted up all that tissue, you've disrupted lots of blood supply. So mm -hmm. what's the last thing you want to do? Choke off the poor little blood supply that's trying to heal you up. And right. so smokers don't get tummy tucks, period. Anybody who does a smoker's tummy tuck is begging for complications and is not thinking carefully about how much they value their medical license because that's a well-known complication to avoid. Mm -hmm. And even if you have stopped smoking, you need to wait months to do a tummy tuck in a previous smoker because it takes forever for their blood supply to rebuild itself if they've been strong enough and lucky enough and fortunate enough to be able to stop smoking. So a lot of times if I know I've got a smoker, 
I'll put them on Chantix. It's like my favorite drug to use. Mm -hmm. Granted, it has all weird, weird kinds of side effects, but it does work really well. I've, I've, I've stopped so many people permanently by using that Chantix really? medication. Yeah. So not everybody's a candidate for it, but if you are a candidate for using Chantix, it has been revolutionary in cutting people's smoking off completely. It makes you actually withdraw and actually hate the taste and smell of smoke. Wow. So it's kind of a cool drive. That is good. Yeah. So it's, it's so some people are like, listen, I, I, I wanted to stop smoking forever. Cold turkey doesn't work. These dumb patches don't work. We try out Chantix. I monitor them to make sure they're safe. And because uh, I know if you could have a flat tummy, you'd want it. For right? sure. Yeah, you'd want it. So they so, just have a couple months and then they're a good candidate. Then, they're, they, be, then they become more, more like anybody else right. in terms of safety. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how soon, usually, a woman seeking out a tummy tuck, like you mentioned, has probably gone through a couple pregnancies, and, and that's the reason she's stretched out. Absolutely. How soon after having a child could someone come in to have this surgery? I'm thinking probably six months, but I think the answer lies more in, are they done breastfeeding, mm -hmm. number one? Are they at a weight where they are no longer losing or gaining? They're pretty stable. Right. Is their overall nutrition been pretty good? Because, you know, having a baby, I mean, I, I hate to say this because I'm not I'm trying to be mean, but because I've got three babies, they're now 18 and 16 <laughs> and 16, but babies are, par theoretically, babies are parasites because they suck out so much nutrition from a woman during gestation that a lot of times she is nutritionally depleted. So she needs a number of months to get stabilized before she can do something as big as a tummy tuck. Sure. And so I would say six months would probably be reasonable, but you know, with women breastfeeding 18 months, two years, I'd say wait. So, cause you know, you don't want to be putting a lot of narcotics or anesthesia into your baby's breast milk. Right. So wait until you're done. Obviously wait until you're done having kids too, right? Even though you've, you may think you want more kids, it's an expensive operation. Mm -hmm. It's also a long recovery. So I usually tell people just wait till you're done having kids then go ahead and have your tummy tuck. It's okay. Because you'd rather just be done, one and done mm -hmm. and, and then not have to do it again. So what about someone that's maybe in her early 20s who perhaps lost a lot of weight or wants to, you know, get out there in the dating scene and she wants a tummy tuck. How often, I mean, do you feel comfortable doing one on a woman who hasn't had children? Yes, I do. Okay. Because that's a different matter. And for, for those women, there's a psychological and a lifestyle component that needs to be addressed. Um, in that scenario, though, I have a very heart-to-heart -heart conversation about it with them. I'm like, listen, you have not had kids. And if you do have kids, my tummy tuck will be destroyed mm -hmm. right it doesn't keep you you know doing a tummy tuck does not keep you from having kids it doesn't keep you from getting pregnant those little that little line of stitches down the midline is only repairing one of the four sets of muscles mm -hmm. so the other three sets of muscles will stretch more and the rectus itself will stretch more right. so you can still have a child that's not a big problem um but for people who are are looking at trying to have a life or maybe get pregnant by finding a man or <laughs> you know or however you know they plan to get pregnant in their lives um looking good is not going to hurt you, right? Right. I mean, feeling good in your clothes is not going to hurt you. So there are people that need that. And we have people who, because of their lifestyles, they have obviously gained tremendous amounts of weight, and then they've figured out a way out of it, either through diet, exercise, or, as I said before, surgical weight loss, like mm -hmm. uh, gastric bypass or the, 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 the new balloons people are swallowing, the Ovalon balloon and yes. all those kinds of cool technologies. And they're losing lots and lots of weight, and they're losing it so fast that the skin just cannot keep up, and it just collapses and breaks. And they're walking around with an apron of, you know, a skirt of fat and skin around them. That stuff has to come off because right. there's there are medical health concerns with having that much extra skin on board. Forget trying to date. You know, if sure. you can't even keep yourself clean, and you're just getting sores, and, and yeah, if you're getting sores and other problems, guaranteed you're not going to be dating, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just not that's not going to happen. <laughs> so, getting your health in check. If it's a health-related issue, then yes, let's take care of it. Let's go ahead and make it so that your skin is healthy, and then from there you notice that your clothes fit better, and then maybe that helps you move on with, okay, now I feel better at the gym. Because mm -hmm. who wants to feel uncomfortable at the gym? The gym is such a 
I love going to the gym, but I know I'm hyper conscious of all these young guys out there that are ripped and I'm 48 and I'm not ripped. I'm a little pudgy and squishy and that's fine because I, you know, I run a business. I've got, I'm a single dad with three kids. So my life is busy and my life is stressful, but, um, a lot of people have that. And so that affects their overall body content and, you know, they, they want to, they, they want to go work out, but you know, I've heard this time and time again, they just don't feel comfortable. They've got mm -hmm. really large breasts. They can't run on a treadmill. They don't feel like they can fit in their, their workout clothes and it becomes sure. emotionally devastating to them. So if we can do something one step at a time to get you there, it's great. I mean, I've seen this before in my liposuction patients. I told you my deal with liposuction patients is always this. I will do liposuction on you if I feel you're adequately a candidate from an emotional and a mental standpoint, and of course your body's gotta be appropriate for spot treatments. But my deal is always, listen, I'm gonna do this, but I want you to go turn up the volume at the gym, sure. or get a trainer, turn down your calories, and take what I've given you as your kind of kick in the pants and the kick down the road and go run with it. And I tell you, there's only been ever been one patient that's failed me because they get it. They're like, listen, I put this time, effort, and money, money. into this. For sure. I just saw a lady the other day. She was so happy. You actually, she actually had, was starting a six pack. And I'm going to tell you, when she started me, there was no six pack. Nowhere <laughs> close to a six pack. But she has made so many changes in her lifestyle and she loves how she looks and feels. And so that's what we want people to do. We want to take the sure. procedures that we do and have them run with it and become even better versions of themselves. Definitely. And I think that so often getting a little confidence at the beginning spurs you on to do more and more and more. You know, you lose a little weight and you feel good about yourself, so you want to lose a little more. So yeah. just having that initial surgery sometimes can, will kickstart someone into hitting the gym and yeah. doing all those things. But I mean, I think that's probably a life lesson right there. Uh -huh. Little successes. Mm. Um, Especially in the, there was a reading, I was, there's a, there's a really cool book that's just been uh, introduced on MSNBC. There's a British author, her name is Caddy Kay, mm -hmm. and she, she writes a book, she wrote this book for women, um, and now this new one's about girls, and because they're talking about girls um, after eight years old having a 30% reduction in confidence levels, and they don't ever really get better. And it starts explaining a confidence gap between young men and young women mm -hmm. and how that can kind of spiral off and um, affect them the rest of their lives. Sure. They're not willing to take risks. They're not willing to fail. They want to be perfectionists. Mm -hmm. You have two girls. Yes. I've got two girls and I can <laughs> see it in them. My son, nowhere, no. he's nothing like those two girls. The two girls are stuck in their, in their like hyper vigilant, not wanting to be imperfect Right. Ways and and then and they they're talking about failure. Well, you know, you want to have successes, but sometimes successes are sweeter because of the failures that came before them. Yeah. And everybody thinks failure is a problem. I mean, if you read any of these modern self help people like Tim Ferriss and Gary Vee and all these kind, of, they're all talking about how failures are the only thing you need to be able to be successful because you never know what success is if you don't have a failure to reflect against. Sure. So why not give yourself little tiny successes? And if my surgery is one success, then you move on. And like I said, most people take it and run with it, and they do a good job of it. And that's good. Yeah, that's absolutely. What they should be doing. Absolutely. So, talking about hitting the gym, that's that's determined. What is what can someone expect out of their recovery time? Like, how long does it take to recover from a tummy tuck? Sure. And what are the restrictions immediately following? So I, you know, I've always been very restrictive with my patients, just because I feel like you know. Don't screw the thing up. Don't 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 screw my work up, because humans are bound to do that because they just don't know, and what you don't know hurts you. Yeah. So I usually tell people it's at least a month before you get to go back to the gym, and honestly, after a good tummy tuck, people can't even stand up straight. Like they walk right. like they are, they're hobbled little old people, mm -hmm. and so you want to be able to just start standing up. And usually, you stand up straight in about two weeks after surgery. And, you know, usually the anesthesia, it's such a big case that the anesthesia hangs around. It's about a month before most people feel that they are decent halfway human beings, you know. Yeah. I will tell you, though, if you are really pre-trained ahead of time, like you're a big gym rat, they bounce back like nobody's business. Really? Like they are standing straight in a week. They're like ready to go. And I have to put the brakes on them because they want to get back to the gym before those muscles have healed. At one month, I start cardio. So... You can go on to the treadmill, you can try gentle jogging, you can go 
the, bike. You can bike, you can get into the pool, those sorts, as long as your wounds are healed, obviously. Um, and in two months, I get you to start working out um, your limbs, your uh, legs, your basic core. I don't want people stomach crunching because a stomach crunch actually is trying to split the rectus muscles apart. Right. And so they're putting a lot of stress on my in, on the repair. So usually I would have you change to something like um, planking. Planks. You know, a plank is a good option for somebody because it's an iso isometric, right? Because it holds length. Yeah, I think so it's an isometric, not isokinetic. One of those things, anyways, whatever. You're the doctor. Uh, yeah, but I, I'm not a physiologist. <laughs> but, um, you know, because it maintains the length of the muscle and holds it in tone, um, it's a different kind of strain on muscle. And it's maintaining that length that actually keeps those center stitches well um, anchored. Now, I do two layers of repair, so I've only ever seen one woman split her stitches. It was a 70-year-old woman. Now, it was more likely the stitches stayed, but the tissues around it tore. Because she was at the gym doing a sit-up and she noticed a pop. Wow. So I went in and fixed it, but that's okay. And we went back in and I, I repaired the problem. But, um, but otherwise, no one's ever broken a single one of my stitches. And that's good. I mean, you want to make sure that when you're in there, that's the time to do it right. Get it done right. Fix it with very, very, very strong suturing so that people can go back and, and really start looking at their core. Because you want that there. So in two months, basically, you can start weightlifting. We wait three to six months before we let you kind of do heavy duty Pilates, yoga, you know, sit ups, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. So just kind of gradually get back into it. Yeah, let your body tell you about it. I mean, yeah. your body is much smarter than you are. I'm sorry, people, you think you're smart. Our bodies and our physiology and our cells are much smarter than we are. So listen, and that's the hard part. A lot of people, no, no one listens. Well, Pain I, is a good signaler. Listen to it. It is, for sure. And if you're going to go through. Like you said, the time, the expense, the pain to do it, it's better to kind of follow doctor's orders. Yeah, you know? I mean, it's, compliance, is, compliance is a good thing. It, it does help us give you the best chance for a, an optimum recovery and a good outcome. But, you know, you're an adult. I expect you to act like one when you're like, <laughs> exactly. you know, just, yeah. you're, just, you're an adult. Try, yeah. try and act yeah. like one, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's obviously a large surgery. What about, has anyone ever asked you if they could have a hysterectomy at the same time as a tummy tuck? Yes, and we can do that. You can Absolutely. Do that. And yeah. is that something that you do? You do both, or do you bring in another no, doctor? No, we, we would bring in a board certified gynecologic, gynecologic. surgeon, okay. yeah, or depending on what we're doing. Obviously, it would have to be only for a benign operation. We certainly would not combine it with uh, an oncologic. So if you have like a uterine cancer or an ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. we would have you treat your cancer first and make sure you're nutritionally are where you need to be, and it would be a year or more after that that we would consider doing a tummy tuck. But if you're just getting a routine hysterectomy, um, it's not a problem because we'll repair the stomach, we'll repair the horizontal incision that they make or a vertical incision, whatever it is, and then we'll do your standard tummy tuck on top of it. Okay. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely doable. It just requires coordination between the, the, the gynecologic surgeon, the OBGYN surgeon, and, and us. For doing the operation. It's a bigger recovery as you can imagine. I'm sure. I mean, you're having two major yeah, two surgeries. Major surgeries. Yeah, but at least you're not going in back to back. Yeah, no. No. And then, and then you can, you know, that way you can basically just do a single operation. You don't have to have like a, a partial transvaginal hysterectomy. They can just do everything from the top mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, heal you up that way. If someone has had a C section, can you use the same scar to go in for a tummy tuck? Sure. Yeah, a lot of times the C-section scar is perfectly fine where it is, mm -hmm. but it's a little high for my taste. Oh, so you can. So I actually, I actually, I usually cut it out. Oh. I usually, it's it's usually probably an inch to two inches above where I actually put uh -huh. the low incision because again, I like to keep a very low. So you can cut it abdominal and pull it incision. Down. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that makes sense. So you get rid of it and just replace it. Yeah, and you know it's very interesting when you look at a woman's abdominal. If you lay a woman down flat, she's got her the xiphoid, which is the midpoint of the where the, the flares of the rib cage meet in the center at the bottom uh -huh. of the sternum. Then, you know, she's got over the upper part of the six pack. And then where the belly button goes in, there's always a little indentation. Then there's past the belly button to go to the lower half. And then wherever her hip flexes and bends in the front, there's a place where you get a bend line, like a credit card bend line. They, a lot of times that's where they put their incision, but that, that's too high for 
a full incision. It would be very hard to hide that once you've stretched everything out. And the problem is, is especially on a woman who, unless you're just a skinny, skinny person, there's always a fat roll above, and then the mons has a bit of fat area in there. Mm -hmm. But where that bend is, it's really, really thin. So instead of being able to get a right, really clean transition from the belly button down to the clitoral area, you get this funny little offset. So that's why I like to make sure that I've cut into the mons fat pad so that it's super thin and clean and flat, and it's just a nice place so that you don't want to have a muffin top after your tummy tuck. No. Right? That's the whole point. Like, you typically don't want to have a muffin top. And so you want to be able to have the front nice and smooth from the belly button down. And, of course, if somebody needs liposuction, we use liposuction to make sure that we clean their flanks up, thin out the abdominal wall, try and match things the best we can. You'll notice, no matter how fat somebody is, they never have, they never have a fat in the crease of the elbow. They never have a fat behind the knee. They never have fat in the crease of the hip. Anywhere where you have to make a motion, mm -hmm. like a, 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 sh a, a hinge type motion, the body knows not to put fat there. But that's the problem, you're fat above and below. <laughs> so it's hard, to, you know, it's hard to match those two, those two areas. So we have to try and make matches happen. Okay. You know, unnaturally by liposuction and yeah. <laughs> where we place the incision. So are you able to tell during a consultation, say for example, if someone could get away with just having liposuction? Sure. Or do you ever get in there and say, okay, well, we've done the lipo and the skin really is hanging and you have the option to do a tummy tuck too. How, is it pretty easy to tell ahead of time? Yes, it is. Yeah. In, my, in my opinion, you know, we look for a lot of things. One, we kind of look at their age. We look at their relative uh, fat content that gives us an idea of how much volume their skin has had to hold in. Yes. Um, we look at their stretch marks, um, how big they are, how tall they are, how extensive they are across the abdominal wall. And you can kind of snap the skin and feel it and pinch it and see if it's thick skin. Usually when they're thicker skin, only mo mild to moderate amounts of fat, not a lot of stretch marks, but they've had kids, you can probably get away with lipocontouring first. And sometimes, actually the nicest way to get the best tummy tuck is actually you stage the operation. The first time around, you do the most aggressive liposuction you possibly safely can do. You wait three to six months, and then you come and do a tummy tuck on that. Oh. And we usually do, the, do that for heavier women. Why? Because a lot of times when you take a woman, so I, I, will, I will be honest, it's, it's, it happens more often than not that a woman comes in, she's got three or four children, she's lucky if she eats one to two meals a day, you can tell she's hyper-stressed, and she carries all of her weight like a little butterball turkey right in the midline. And so you pinch her outside fat and you realize she's got an inch of pinch, yet she's sticking out like she's, you know, four months pregnant. Mm -hmm. You know that the problem there is stress fat. And that's fat inside the abdominal wall. That's fat that you can't liposuction out. You, can't, you have to either starve it out or you have to decrease your cortisol, decrease your stress, oh, wow. increase your cardio, increase your water intake, and have the body burn off that stress fat. Mm -hmm. So the one thing you can do to make all things worse for yourself is not eat properly. And that, for most people, it's not necessarily just the fuel content, it's they don't even eat enough a day. They eat one meal, two meals a day because they're so busy. Well, the problem with being so busy and is it means you're so stressed. And when you're so stressed and the body only recognizes that it's getting maybe one, maybe two meals a day, it is going to hold on to every iota of calorie it possibly can. Mm -hmm. And in that process, it's going to store it. It's going to store it like a squirrel stores nuts for the winter. You know, it'll mm -hmm. put it all around your intestines. And actually, that's deadly fat. That's the fat that gives you higher incidences of strokes and cardiovascular disorders. So you don't want a lot of gut fat. And so these women are a setup and they come in asking for tummy tucks. Well, I did one of those at the beginning of my career, and I've never done one since. Why? She was just as round as she was. She just looked like a tight... She looks like she just it's swallowed a, a bowling ball. It's the apple-shaped woman. Yeah, the apple-shaped woman, yeah. And so she was just as apple-shaped. I barely could pull any skin off, and it made no sense to do the operation. That was when I was young and not as smart as I am now. <laughs> uh, you know, I actually work with local weight loss clinics and weight loss services to prep a patient ahead of time for the operation. Because in the end, while I can do the tummy tuck, I actually want them to have a good life. And I do care about my patients, and it's very important that they get 
maybe a better way to do things, mm -hmm. maybe learn how to cook a little bit better, maybe mm -hmm. learn how to eat and take care of themselves. They're not going to be mothers of children under 18 forever. You know, they have to learn how to take That's care right. of themselves, right? They're eventually going to be empty nesters and they're going to now have to deal with the nonsense of their husbands, <laughs> right? And all the stress that goes around there and they're going to have to take care of themselves because maybe they're not going to have a marriage that survives, but they're going to want to be an independent woman who takes care of herself and feels better about herself and lives a good life and is a model for her children. And the same thing goes for the dads. I mean, I don't want to single out women for this, but women make up the vast majority of tummy tuck patients, and we aren't talking about tummy tucks. How often do you perform a ton tummy tuck on a man? Um, I'd say probably 1% or 2%. It's not a very yeah. common operation in my practice because my male patients are primarily facial plastic surgery mm -hmm. patients, a lot of male rhinoplasties, male facelifts, uh, acne scarring, that sort of thing. Um, there are practices in town that do a lot of that post-bariatric stuff. So. Oh. Men are, a lot of times the male tummy tucks are usually the bariatric patients, the guys who've had their uh, stomach stapled or the gastric bypass, sense. and they come in. But just purely cosmetic male tummy tucks, usually the, because men's skin is thicker, mm -hmm. um, they tend to, um, their elasticity is better. So it's not a common mm -hmm. thing for men to come in with just hanging skin, mm -hmm. who have just lost weight at the gym, that sort of thing. And nowadays with these new non-invasive technologies, I'm predicting there'll be even fewer male tummy tucks because they'll just use the J-plasma or the body tight or thermi and they'll just do a series of subdermal heatings or topical heatings yeah. to uh, try and shrink wrap that little bit of loose skin that you see once they've developed their body. Because I've seen some pictures on YouTube of people that were like 350 pounds. There's like this one, one rock star's bodyguard, he was like 347 pounds. He got down to 190 pounds of rock hard muscle. He could barely see extra skin around his nipples and a little bit really? on the. I mean, he was ripped. So, but he did it when he was sub 40. So, when his skin, when your skin's good, a man can lose a significant amount of weight and not have to have so much um, excess skin. But again, if you're 400 pounds, you're going to get bariatric surgery. It's not even right. an issue. You'll have skin everywhere. So, yes. But the typical guy coming and losing weight, they, they try the non-invasive methods first. Okay. Uh, is there anything else you need to, you feel like we need to let our listeners know that we, we didn't touch on? Yeah, I mean, I think tummy tuck is a procedure that really because of its return on investment, it's something that a lot of people can entertain. But you don't have, you don't want to entertain it lightly. I mean, you have to have a good support system so if you're the one that takes care of everything in the house you're definitely going to need to make sure that you don't get to be the one to take care of everything in the house after surgery you cannot be picking up laundry doing dishes leaning over and bending down to pick up things no you're the princess you're the queen of the house <laughs> everybody else around you's got to figure it out or bring you know bring an in-law bring a parent bring somebody in your life to be around to help you with those sorts of things. especially with a lot of tummy tucks a lot of times tummy tucks are with women who have not had all their kids leave the house. And they've got single digit children in there and Definitely. 12 year olds. And so, so you have to kind of rely on other people helping you. Number two, you know, take care of it afterwards. Like it's, it's the, the thing that I hate the most is when somebody comes in and does some plastic surgery and then does not take care of their investment. And like I said, it's a rarity, but you know, usually they come to me going, oh my, that's not as good as they wanted. Well, I'm, then I have to sit there and I have to, be the wet blanket and go well you didn't do what you were supposed to do so you need to be in the right mindset to to be successful at the tummy tuck because it is a rough recovery ask any woman who's done it it's not easy now we've got these long-term local anesthetics called Expirel injections that we can put in i did one recently mm -hmm. boy she barely complained about anything until about two days ago really yeah she's like a week out or eight days out from her tummy tuck and she was doing great That's um amazing. i didn't hear a thing about her she's freaking out about the post-op pain Mm -hmm. She was freaking she was out. Afraid. She was really afraid of it, yeah. And so I said, well, we'll put Expirel in. And I, I did a whole bottle of Expirel, and she barely whined about it. Wow. Now, now, two days ago, she called in asking She's for like, pain yeah. meds. Now she can feel everything. So, <laughs> And that's great. And that's what you want to see. But, um, you know, also know that sometimes, you know, the ideal tummy tuck patient is not the ideal tummy tuck patient until they do some things for themselves, like lose some weight. And you really don't want to do things like tummy tucks or lipo until you're under about 30% above your ideal body weight. That's the big thing about it. You will run a much higher risk of pulmonary complications, blood clots in the legs, blood clots shooting off to the lungs called a, a pulmonary embolism, when you are not close to ideal body weight. 
because you're tightening everything on that abdominal wall and you're kind of getting rid of all that loose skin and you're changing your activity levels in those first few weeks, we do have higher risks of things like blood clots and uh, pulmonary emboli. And that means there's a, a little bit of a higher death rate associated with tummy tucks than other types of plastic surgery. But, you know, I've never had one. I've had blood clots, but I haven't had anybody die from any of my surgeries, to be honest with you, knock on wood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, those are the things that I would, I would think you would need to know to be ready for it. But, you know, have a good support system, be kind of mentally prepared for success, and, you know, follow your doctor's orders. Like, when I tell you to get up and move around, please get up and move around. Don't be a vegetable. Don't sit there in your bed all day long. You know, don't let the pain be the end-all be-all, because it will go away. You know, you will stop hurting. You will feel great. And then you'll look at yourself and you'll be like every single person I've ever done a tummy tuck on. It is a 100% successful operation, period. All the little tiny wound healing things that might happen, etc. Eh, whatever. They happen. But we treat them and you move on. Things heal up and it's not a big deal. You might need scar revisions. You might need, you know, maybe some dog ears repaired on the sides. Those are small problems. Don't worry about them. Your doctor will take care of them six months to a year afterwards to finalize and make your tummy tuck perfect. But do what you're supposed to do. Follow your doctor's orders to the T and you'll get great results. I will tell you one thing that's been really cool. A number of years ago, we started using this really cool product called Embrace. And uh, I'll put that link down in the, uh, in the uh, de description box. Embrace is a really cool engineered dressing. It's a sticky dressing that we put on the incision mm -hmm. for about two to six weeks after and has made it has taken people who would normally be very very poor scars and it gives them like pencil thin beautiful incisional scars. Yeah it's it, it's phenomenal so it's every one of our tummy tuck patients gets it. In fact we now use it on our brachioplasty patients. Uh -huh. We use it on certain aspects of the scars of tummy tucks, butt lifts, anywhere where we know, where we know there's going to be higher tension and certainly scars don't turn out as good as they could, we try to use it and it's been fantastic. That's amazing. So definitely make sure your doctor uses Embrace or go to a surgeon that uses Embrace for your tummy tuck. That's how you're going to get great scars. I do great closures, period, but that doesn't matter. I can't control every aspect of your healing. The Embrace gives me a leg up, gives you a leg up in an insurance policy against crappy scars. So. Definitely Good. use Embrace. Okay. So I guess it's time for the, the real self, self question today. today. Which actually, funny enough, is perfect for what we were just talking about. Oh, okay, good. So the real self question is, what is the best way to care for a scar after surgery? I want the best possible long-term results. Okay. So I, that's a good question. I will tell you there's two types of scars. There's long scars and short scars, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then within the long scars and short scars, there's scars that are either in mobile areas or scars that are in immobile areas. So, one of the most important things for scar management, more than anything else, is recognizing your genetics. So, if you are lily white, northern European, your chances of bad scars are on the low end. Redheads, best scarring of all the people in the world. Blondes, blue eyes, great scarring. As you start getting more and more pigment in your skin, as you start getting more and more skin of oiliness or thicker um, content, your scar tension start to go up and your chances for bad scarring, hyperpigmented scarring, etc. start going up. So, one thing you want to make sure you can do, no matter who you are, is take all the tension or stretch off a scar possible. So, whether that means you're doing the embrace dressing we talked about, or you're using topical um, scar glues, or you're using serial taping with paper tape, um, Anything that can reduce motion and pulling on the scar gives the scar the best chance of healing in an immobile, non-movable, minimally mobile state. Because when scars move, they start making bridges. And when those scars make bridges, they start getting wider, they start getting thicker and heaped up, and then you end up with what's called a hypertrophic scar. Hypertrophic scars can happen to anybody, doesn't matter where they're from. So a surgeon who does not put a scar in the right way on a movable area, you're going to end up with a bad scar and you got to come back and fix it. Certain areas of a person's body have high tension, like the midline of the breast. So anybody who gets like a, uh, a piercing in her chest wall, you know, piercings up there are like a thing for some people, yeah. they, have, they stand a high chance of getting hypertrophic scars because the breasts stretch that area from their weight. 
and then you get the scar, oh, um, yeah. you get tension on the scar Living. across the shoulder or upper back area. Those are high areas of incidence for hypertrophic scars. So anytime you know you've got something that needs to be treated in those areas, your doctor needs to spend extra time managing the scar. A great thing that people can do after surgery on any scars, they can get what's called silicone sheeting. Uh -huh. And there's a great website called makemeheal.com that I tell people to go to. It's just a big patient um, website for plastic surgery, but I, and I have, no, I have no affiliation. I don't get kickbacks or anything. Um, but they have, you can order silicone sheeting from there, but there's other places. You can, so silicone rubber put on a scar can soften scars, can take the blood supply down, can keep them nice and flat, and can reduce redness. And scars are going to manage. I mean, it could take between 6 and 24 months for a scar to be fully managed. So you have to be patient as well. So yes. you can't go, okay, I did this for two weeks and then my life takes over and I forget about it. No, you need to manage your scars for a good six months. And so if you've got questions about your scars or if you feel like your scars are starting to get out of hand, go see your doctor because they may want to inject steroids in it. Mm -hmm. They may want to kind of shut down the scar process because there are certain kinds of scars that no matter what you do perfectly, your, genetic, your genetics are going to allow for making of bad scars, and those are something called keloids. Now, patients always coming in, uh, patients always come and go, look, doc, I have problems with keloids from previous operations, and I'm looking at their, their scars going, no, those are hypertrophic scars. These are white people telling me about keloids. <laughs> keloids are much more common in dark-skinned individuals. African Americans have, like, the highest incidence of keloids in this country, and it has to do with a body tissue plane basically not turning off its scarring mechanism so it's almost like a cancer now it's not a cancer it's not like you can die from it but a cancer is basically replicating cells that don't turn off well this is a scar whose cells replicate and don't turn off mm -hmm. so the scars get bigger and bigger and bigger like the most common way you see keloids are in ear piercings they make these. They look like they've got big hunks of cauliflower uh -huh. sitting off their 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 ears or just simple piercing just from a simple piercing yeah and so you've got to come in and people some people have really bad scarring problems I mean they have their ears reset partially their ears resected I mean it gets rough so you want to manage those ahead of time by one recognizing the patient as higher risk and managing whatever wound you put on them whatever incision you use the best way you can and that you take all the care you can for it Sometimes you prep ahead of time and you start injecting with steroids ahead of time to kind of prepare the area. So hmm. the best wound care, the best kind of incisions after elective surgery come from, one, the doctor's technique of closure, two, your ethnic makeup, three, how you manage the tension, and four, certain groups are at higher risk for bad scars regardless of what you do. So you just do the best you can, um, see what the final scar burden is, and then go back and do touch-ups, whether it's laser resurfacing, mm -hmm. the cutting out the scar and starting again, steroid injections, or like I said, try to try to get it up front, use your silicone gel on lays and you'll get good scars. We make great scars here. It's just kind of like if yes. you recognize what your patient's shortcomings might be with scars, you work ahead of time mm -hmm. to avoid that problem. Um, that's a, I like that. We make good scars here. We do make good scars here. <laughs> So, well, listen, today was a little bit of a shorter vlog, but uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about tummy tucks. We'll have those uh, two different links down in the description box. And again, please, if you like our videos, please share them, subscribe to us. We want to make sure that we're getting the word out um, to people who are interested in, in plastic surgery, cosmetic surgery, general health, and, you know, stay tuned. Again, if you've got uh, questions in the comment section below, please put your questions in. If you've got topics you want to hear me talk about, you know, uh, let me know. And if you want to contact us, you know, I'm at info at drmanishshaw.com. And I look forward to our next time with you here in a couple of weeks. Anything All right. Else? No. Well, this Good is much. Dr. Shaw. And, of course, this is Misty signing off. And um, we hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.